this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. And you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. Antiquities, a series of studies in the Bible, archaeology, and history. I am E. Raymond Capt, biblical archaeologist and research historian. Our Creator has revealed many things to man in many ways. In addition to the written word of the Bible, we learn from creation itself and from the archaeological record of past civilizations. This series is designed to open your understanding to many truths, some of which may be new to you. Allow the Holy Spirit, or Spirit of Truth, and the Word of God to be your guide. This series is narrated by Paul H. John. The Dead Sea Scrolls The bright sun beat mercilessly down on the rock-strewn desert plateau overlooking the Dead Sea. Shimmering heat waves covered the flat surface of the water. Inside the assembly hall of a nearby monastery, a group of men in white robes sat in council. What shall we do? one elder cried. The men of darkness will soon be here. Another spoke up. Yes, they are already in Jericho. An older, white-bearded elder, sitting at a podium at the end of the hall, slowly rose to his feet and said, Vespasian's legionnaires will surely fall upon our community. This may be the end of the world. Now at last, perhaps, our Messiah will appear. Until then, we have much to do. Our prayers, our holy meals will have to be prepared, and our sacred scrolls must be taken to the caves and hidden from the impious enemy. We must hurry. The Romans did come, and in that summer the community of the New Covenant sank beneath the surging tide of history that laid waste to Jerusalem. For nearly nineteen centuries the Covenanteers remained a dim tradition. Christianity spread far and wide from Jerusalem, and then from Palestine. Rome fell, Mohammed's conquering armies came, passing within a few miles of the caves of Qumran. Then came the Crusaders, passing by again and again, never suspecting the cave's secrets. Today they are yielding up those secrets while the world looks on in fascination and awe. In the spring of 1947, a 15-year-old Bedouin boy threw a stone at a cliff face, landing in a small cave. The boy heard the sound of pottery breaking and climbed up to investigate the cause of the sound. He discovered the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls, hidden for nearly 2,000 years in the caves at Qumran. Since their discovery, much has been written about the scrolls, the ruins of the Qumran monastery and the Essenes who were responsible for the preservation of the biblical texts. These are available in many bookstores and in any public library. For this reason, this study will deal mainly with the contents of the scrolls themselves. Most of them were written in the Aramaic script, a square-type letter in common use in the last centuries of the Second Temple, or the Zerubbabel period. This period started about fifty years after Solomon's Temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. A few scrolls were found written in the Archaic or Paleo-Hebrew script in use around 1000 B.C. and is a variant of the Phoenician script used during the First Temple period. The discovery of the scrolls caused biblical archaeologists to figuratively leap for joy when the news of the Dead Sea Scrolls spread. Valuable new information was now available in the field of Hebrew studies. More importantly, here was background material for the study of the Old Testament biblical text itself. Previous to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
The earliest dated manuscript of the Hebrew Old Testament was limited largely to the Masoretic text known as Rabbinic Judaism. The oldest copy now extant is from about 900 A.D. The finding of the scrolls provide us with the Hebrew text of Isaiah and other books of the Old Testament nearly 1,000 years older. Thus, we now have a text going back beyond several hands or translations in order to check the accuracy of it and possibly correct any errors in our present translations. The first cave discovered by the Bedouin boy is known today as Cave No. 1. A partial list of the manuscripts is as follows. A complete scroll of Isaiah. Portions of another scroll of Isaiah. A commentary on the first two chapters of Habakkuk. A scroll now known as the Manual of Discipline, which describes admission into and membership of the Qumran community a scroll of thanksgiving hymns or devotional poetry, rules for a war, real or spiritual, to occur in the last day or days. This is known as the war of the sons of light with the sons of darkness, a very fragile and brittle scroll which could not be opened before a long and careful treatment. It has now been identified as a Genesis Apocryphon. The Genesis Apocryphon contained an interesting account of the birth of Noah, new to Bible students. It also contained a colorful description of the beauty of Sarah, which brings to mind the twelfth chapter of Genesis, where Abraham feared that Pharaoh would desire his wife as they approached Egypt. The actual translation of the appearance of Sarah is as follows. Her skin was pure white. She had long and lovely hair. Her limbs were smooth and rounded, and her thighs were shapely. She had slender legs and small feet. Her hands were slim and long, and so were her fingers. Unfortunately, no description of Abraham appears in the scroll, but as Sarah's description is that of her racial attributes, we can conclude, since Abraham was a relative, he would have similar coloring and features. One of the scrolls from cave number one is known as the Manual of Discipline. The scroll indicated that a group of devout Hebrews had become dissatisfied with the official priesthood in Jerusalem and had moved out into the desert. There they called themselves the penitents of the desert and the true sons of Zadok in reference to the foremost priestly family in the time of David, spoken of in 2 Samuel, verse 17. This was the family Ezekiel had designated as the only legitimate priests. The Manual of Discipline scroll also contained two blessings for a Zadokite priest. The manuscript dates back from 100 to 75 B.C., and a translation of the last four verses of the second blessing reads as follows. May the Lord bless you from his holy dwelling, and make for you a glorious adornment among the holy ones, and renew for you the covenant of everlasting priesthood, and grant you your place in the holy dwelling. And by what comes from your lips all princes of nations, may he grant you possession of the best of all choice things, and through you may he bless the purposes of all flesh. From the same scroll we find the Qumranians believed that before things came into existence, God determined the plan of them, which sounds like predestination, does it not? They also stated that God created man to rule the world, but appointed for him two spirits, the spirit of truth and the spirit of perversity. Man has the choice to walk in either. This sounds like as if a man also has some free will. Among the scrolls is one that is known as the Damascus document, which gives official exhortations and ordinances to the Qumranian community. Mentioned in the scroll is reference to God's covenant with Israel as forever, and his remembrance of the covenant made to the patriarchs, being Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, also mention is made of the star that has journeyed out of Jacob 
and a scepter that is risen out of Israel. Both these are familiar to Bible students. Perhaps the most important scroll in some respects is the complete scroll of Isaiah from cave number one. It was found in 1947 and was brought to the American School of Oriental Research in 1948. It measures about 24 feet in length and about 10 inches in height. It consisted of 17 sheets of parchment sewn together and containing 54 columns. The writing is very clear and is considered rather beautiful. Paleographers, experts in ancient writings, have dated this to about 150 B.C. The text of the Isaiah scroll can be said to be reasonably close to the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Old Testament from which our present-day Bible comes. There are, however, some important differences in details in many passages and hundreds of minor variations, such as in spelling and grammar. It is interesting to note that the Isaiah manuscript has been examined and corrected in antiquity. Corrections are often in the scribe's own handwriting, having copied the scroll, but occasionally in some other scribe's handwriting. In a nearby cave, number four, was found copies of fragments of every book of the Old Testament except the book of Esther. This omission does seem to support those scholars who believe the book has no place in our Bible. However, there are other scholars who offer evidence to the contrary. Also in cave number four was found a commentary on the book of Habakkuk, as well as commentaries on other biblical books. These are by the Qumranians themselves, perhaps for guidance and teaching of newcomers to the community. In their commentaries, the method was to quote a passage and then to interpret it with a statement beginning with the word pishro, which means, the interpretation is. Such a work is called a pesher interpretation. Because there are so many differences occurring in the Habakkuk commentary scroll, there is much controversy among biblical scholars. Some believe that the Qumranians twisted scriptures to their own ends, while others hold that the Masoretic text, drawn up about 100 to 300 A.D., does not faithfully represent the Hebrew text as originally written by the authors of the Old Testament. This latter viewpoint can be shown to be correct. Some scholars state the differences are minor, but this writer disagrees. Some years ago, Bible scholars noted that the Hebrew word virgin in describing the mother of Jesus was translated from a Hebrew word that more correctly should have read young woman, and several modern translations of the Bible changed the word virgin to young women. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls, written a thousand years earlier than the Masoretic text from whence the change was made, uses a Hebrew word that has only one meaning, virgin. This is surely not a minor difference. One of the scrolls of the Psalms from cave number four measured, when unrolled, about thirteen feet in length, although it was originally much longer. The fragment remaining contained thirty-eight psalms, from Psalm 90 to 150, but they were arranged in a different order than in our present Bibles. Most interesting was that the scroll contained seven apocryphal psalms, three of which were not known to exist. It also contained a paragraph of prose which stated that King David composed 4,050 psalms and songs. The copied scroll is dated from about A.D. 30 to A.D. 50. We now know that the apocryphal books were considered sacred writings by the Qumranians. Among them were the testaments of the twelve patriarchs. In each, the patriarch exhorts his descendants to be of a virtuous conduct. In fact, every apocryphal book has been found among the scrolls. So the question of the omission of the apocryphal books from the Protestant Bible should be re-examined. They have now been found in both Hebrew and Aramaic. The only reason for their removal from the text of the King James Bible was that only Greek versions existed at that time. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls is one that is the oldest biblical manuscript in existence that we know of. 
It is a fragment of the book of Exodus. This copy is dated to about the middle of the 3rd century B.C. It may have been a scroll the scribe was copying from. The unaided eye can see little on the surface of the skin, but infrared and ultraviolet photography has yielded a decipherment that is fairly complete. A variation from our standard text is found in Exodus chapter 40, verse 17. After the words, second year, which ends the verse in our Bible, the scroll added this phrase, since they went out of Egypt. This additional phrase is also found in the Septuagint and the Samaritan version of the Exodus. Another new psalm to emerge from the caves at Qumran was a new psalm reflecting an extraordinarily close relationship with the early Christian messianic beliefs, reading it line by line as found in the scroll. The heavens and the earth will obey his Messiah, the sea and all that is in them. He will not turn aside from the commandment of the Holy One. Take strength in his mighty work, all ye who seek the Lord. Will you not find the Lord in this, all ye who wait with hope in your hearts? Surely the Lord will seek out the pious, and will call the righteous by name. His Spirit will hover over the poor. By his might will he restore the faithful. He will glorify the pious on the throne of the eternal kingdom. He will release the captives, make the blind to see, raise up the downtrodden. Forever I will cleave to him against the powerful, and I will trust in his loving kindness. And in his goodness forever, his holy Messiah will not be slow in coming. And as for the wonders that are not the work of the Lord, when the Messiah comes, then he will heal the sick, resurrect the dead, and to the poor announce good tidings. He will lead the holy ones, he will shepherd them, he will do all and all of it. It sounds as if King David might have written this. There are similarities between it and Psalm 146. Perhaps this scroll was one of the over 4,000 compositions attributed to David. Based on references to biblical writings which no longer exist, estimated to be well over 100, it is very probable that among the hundreds of non-biblical scrolls or fragments of scrolls are many of the so-called lost books of the Bible. While many are of a historical nature, others could be directly inspired words of God to his people. One of the most important scrolls from the standpoint of shedding light on historical Bible prophecy is one found in cave number four. It was a collection of hymns and prayers for daily recitation and copy, and is dated to about 175 to 125 B.C. Previously unknown, the scribe conveniently wrote the name of the scroll on the back of the fragment, the words of the luminaries. Line by line it reads, They have forsaken the source of living waters, and they have served a strange god in their land. Then their land also was laid wasted, delivered into the hand of their enemies. For there was poured out your rage and the heat of your anger with the fire of your jealousy in order to make a desert, where no one comes or goes. In spite of all, you have not rejected the offspring of Jacob, and you have not cast away Israel to its destruction by breaking your covenant with them. For you are a living God, you alone, and there is none other but you. You remembered your covenant, you who brought us forth in the sight of the nations, and did not abandon us among the nations. You have shown favor to Israel, your people in all the lands where you exiled them, in order that they might take it to heart and return unto you and listen to your voice. I wonder how many of you noticed that the Qumranians were actually thanking God for remembering his covenant with the house of Israel, the so-called lost tribes of Israel, then taken captive to Assyria around 721 B.C., and Israel that our leading theologians say became lost forever. Here, after some 600 years after their captivity, the Qumranians knew that they were not lost forever, but were only exiles. This subject was covered in a previous study. 
You may have noticed that there is no hint of a spiritual Israel or a spiritual church in these prayers of thanks to God. Both are inventions of the Roman Church at the time of the Reformation of the 15th century and adopted by the Reformation Protestant churches. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls was a manuscript that might very well be one of the lost books from our original scriptures. The copy is dated about 300 B.C., but keep in mind the original this was taken from would have been centuries earlier. The theme of the scroll was the objection of the appointment of foreigners to the Israelitish priesthood and appears to have been written by Kahath, the grandfather of Moses. This thought is based on the reference to Amran as my son. Amran was another name for Moses. Son in Hebrew could also indicate a grandson. Reading again from it, line by line. And the Most High God for all eternity shall shine down as a light upon you and make known to you his great name. And you will know him who is the God everlasting, the Lord of all creation, the Sovereign of all, governing all things according to his will. And he gives you joy and happiness for your sons in the dwelling of righteousness forever. And now, my sons, be watchful of the inheritance vouchsafed unto you, that your fathers bequeathed you. Do not give your inheritance to foreigners, not your heritage, lest you be humiliated and you be looked on with derision in their eyes, and they trample you, for they will come to dwell among you and become your masters. Therefore hold fast to the words of Jacob and Isaac, and be strong in the judgments of Abraham, the righteous of Levi and myself. Be holy and pure from all, holding to the truth, and in all things walking in fairness, not deceit, but with a pure heart and a just and truthful spirit. Thus you will bequeath to me a good name among you, and joy to Levi, and happiness to Jacob, and rejoicing to Isaac, and a blessing to Abraham, Inasmuch as you guarded and walked in the inheritance, my sons, your fathers bequeathed you truth, righteousness, and uprightness, integrity, purity, holiness, and the priesthood, in accordance with what you have commanded. These words of advice could just as well have been written for us today. History indicates our founding fathers heeded that advice. There has been a question among Bible scholars as to why the assigned translators of the scrolls have delayed for over 20 years in releasing the Dead Sea Scrolls material. Most of the unpublished scrolls were assigned to Israeli translators, and one reason could be because the official position of the Israeli government, and perhaps also held by the translators, is that nowhere in the scrolls is found mention of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Son of the Most High, or a crucified Messiah. They recognize the word Messiah is often found, but that would only refer to a king. Having had many kings, one could expect many messiahs. The translators could still be sitting on the scrolls they were entrusted to translate if the Huntington Library in the city of Pasadena, California, had not disclosed in 1991 that it possessed a complete set of microfilm of all of the unpublished scrolls, over 800 in number, and that they intended to publish them in a book available to the public and any scholar to work on their translations. The microfilms had been entrusted to the library by Betty Bechdel of the Bechdel Corporation, who had commissioned them around 1961. Over the protests of the Director of Israel's Antiquities Authority, the library announced its intention of making the microfilms accessible to any scholar who wished to see them. Subsequently, they were all published in a book, available to the public. In the newly published scrolls, references clearly mentioned the Son of God, Son of the Most High, and a pierced Messiah, which provide evidence that our modern Bibles contain valid prophecies of Christ, based on pre-Christian texts, and not added in the A.D. period, as critics of the scriptures maintain. With that cat out of the bag, so to speak, the assigned translators have published their work and have given no reasons for their delay. 
Several of the newly released scrolls clearly mention the terms Son of God and Son of the Most High. Son of God he will be called, and Son of the Most High they will name him. Like the flashes that you saw, so will their kingdom be. They will rule for years on earth, and they will trample all. People they will trample, people and province, province until the people of God arise, and all rest from the sword. His kingdom will be an everlasting, and all his ways in truth. He will judge the earth in truth, and all will make peace. The sword will cease from the earth, and all provinces will worship him. The great God will be his patron. He will make wars for him. He will give peoples into his hand, and all of them he will cast down before him. His sovereignty is everlasting sovereignty, and deeps, The rest is missing from this scroll. From the Manual of Discipline of the Qumran community, we find these words. The truth is born out of the spring of light, falsehood from the well of darkness. The dominion of all the children of truth is in the hands of the angels of light, so that they walk in the ways of light. The spirits of truth and falsehood struggle within the heart of man, behaving with wisdom and folly. And according as a man inherits truth, so will he avoid darkness. Blessings on all that have cast their lot with the law, that walk truthfully in all their ways. May the law bless them with all good, and keep them from evil, and illumine their hearts with insight into the things of life, and grace them with knowledge of things eternal. These are certainly words of wisdom. Another part of the Manual of Discipline reads, The law was planted to reward the children of light with healing and abundant peace, with long life, with fruitful seed of everlasting blessings, with eternal joy in immortality of eternal light. From their commentaries, we find the Qumranians shared many beliefs with the Christians of today. However, They did not look for this world to end in a fiery holocaust as some theologians teach today, nor did they look for a so-called rapture of Christians from this earth. They did look for a great battle to take place between the forces of evil against the forces of good at the end of this world order and the coming of the Messiah, whom they called the offshoot of David a term that would indicate Jesus of Nazareth, who would execute victory for the righteous and who would take the throne of David and establish his reign worldwide for everlasting generations. This is a belief held by many Christians today, the answer to the prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. I would like to close this study with an ascenic blessing. May he bless thee with every good. May he keep thee from evil and illumine the heart with eternal wisdom. And may he give his sevenfold blessing upon thee to everlasting peace. I hope you have enjoyed this study in Biblical Antiquities, covering archaeological research in the Bible lands that has led to a proper understanding